Let me have you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. Hebrews, chapter 2. Last week, we looked at the first four verses of this chapter. Now let's continue with verses 5 through 8 today. 5 through 8. Hebrews 2, and beginning there at verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. We'll stop right there. The writer of Hebrews uh, comes back to a tribulation context for the uh, book because he mentions an age to come in which the entire world will be subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. And then he says, Whereof we speak. The millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. Whereof we speak. Well, where did he speak of it? Unless it was back in chapter 1. Look back at Hebrews chapter 1. And um, we call your attention to verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. And then also down to verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness, is the scepter of thy kingdom. And in the verses 13 and 14, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Uh, Paul is aiming the book doctrinally at someone in Daniel's 70th week. He's right on the threshold of the second advent of Christ, the second glorious coming of Jesus Christ. Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, is primarily a doctrinal dissertation aimed at Hebrews in the tribulation, the tribulation Jews, if you will. Verse 6 says, but one in a certain place, that's going to be King David in Psalm 8, verse 4, testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Those are two good questions. What is God who oversees his universe? He knows every thought in the minds of seven and a half billion people simultaneously, without any conflict or confusion whatsoever. He knows everything transpired, taking place throughout his creation, and the visible creation. Um, so, what is God doing wasting his time with someone like us, with people like us? Why would God uh, condescend to worry about us with all he has to oversee, with all, although not that he is really taxed, overseeing his creation. He made it and knows how exactly it functions by itself because he set it in motion that way. But what is, um, what is God doing giving man the time of day? You and I don't deserve it. You and I are insignificant. Alongside the glory and the splendor of God and Jesus Christ, you and I are nothing. You and I are nothing. We're less than nothing. And if a person is honest, if he can assess his own heart and his own lusts and his own appetites, his own greed, his own desire and drive for uh, self-promotion and so on, he should be able to 
but realize alongside the deity, he's absolutely nothing. There's nothing he, he has to offer to God. You don't possess anything uh, that you could give to God that he doesn't already own. You don't have anything that you can offer to him. He wants your uh, yieldedness. He wants your submission and <coughs> obedience. Uh, but he's not going to twist your arm and force you to. He wants to earn that by his love uh, for your sake, his death on the cross of Calvary, his blessings to you, the answers to prayer day after day and year in, year out. So what is God doing wasting his time with sinners like us? And secondly... What is man that he should even attract the attention of God or attract the interest of God? Man is, like I say, completely insignificant alongside the Lord God of the Bible. Go back, if you will, to the book of Job, chapter 7. Job 7. Job dwells on this very question. Job 7, and look there, verses 17 and 18. He asks, What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, or that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment? Every moment? You know, there are at least seven billion people in this world who don't know your name, nor are they interested in knowing your name. They could care less about you, and you probably could care less about most of them. You and I live um, concerned with our own wants, our own needs, our own drives, our own passions, and uh, we can't see beyond our own wants most of the time. And uh, so the idea that, that, you know, it's very, it, it takes effort to be a little bit uh, altruistic and, and do something for someone else's benefit without any expectation of, of being recognized or being paid back or receiving some sort of credit for it. Um, the, the truly a kind-hearted person does without needing to be recognized for it. And... Um, the one who truly acts charitably without ever being recognized for it, uh, without even being identified as the one behind that kind act. That is the truly a charitable and kind-hearted person. But it takes effort to live that way. Most of us don't live that way. I was talking with Brother Everett about a car accident I had uh, last week with my dad's car. Mine was in the shop and he was kind enough to let me borrow his. And a couple of days before I got my car back, I had a car accident with his car. And um, I don't consider, I don't think either one, mine or with his car, were entirely my fault. One was not my fault at all. But I felt really bad in the idea that, uh, that his, uh, his insurance rates may go up because I was driving his car and got into an accident. And I told Brother Charles, I, I don't want to see that those rates for my mom and dad's go up. And Brother Charles said, well, you could offer to pay that extra amount each month for them. I said, well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, that's the way we are. We're, we're given to selfish desires, selfish drives, and uh, very rarely do we think about other people and care about them and want to know more about them and how we can help and aid them. And uh, so, so what does man, what does man have to offer that should attract the interest of God, the attention of God? You and I have nothing to offer him. And then verse 7 in our text, it says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Uh, that doesn't speak very kindly about the angels uh, barely above man. If man is a little lower than the, than the angels, and man is nothing, that doesn't put the angels on a very high level of status either. You know, think of it that way. You know, oh, they're lofty. They're in the in the uh, ethereal uh, realm, and uh, where they're way beyond our reach. But um, 
It says, Thou crownest him with glory and honor. That's going to be Adam and his original commission uh, received from God. Run back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1. The very first chapter in your Bible, Genesis 1. And look there uh, at verses 26 through 27, or through 28, 26 through 28. Genesis 1 and verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moveth upon the earth. And that commission was repeated later on in Genesis 9 to Noah after he and his sons and their wives came out of the ark. Genesis 9, verses 1 and 2, which we don't need to turn. But he said to Noah, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, being the Bible believers that we profess to be, we don't believe in changing one word or trying to correct the Bible um, and, and improve the Bible. God told Noah, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, and that's pretty self-explanatory. It means to refill, repopulate the world, now that I've wiped everyone else out except your family. And yet he told Adam in Genesis 1 to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This leads us to the, the doctrine which is sometimes referred to as the gap theory, that between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, God drowned the world out with a flood before he began again with Adam. There may have been some race of beings or men or someone like men prior to that time. And there, there are enough verses, I think, in the scriptures you, could, you can probably hang your hat on that doctrine, although it's not spelled out in blatant, clear, uh, unambiguous detail. And nevertheless, it seems to be what the Bible would suggest, just comparing scripture with scripture. But... God told them to replenish the earth. And uh, verse 8 in our text, uh, let's see. No, verse, back to verse 7. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. That was uh, God's commission to Adam, to be fruitful and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowls of the air and the cattle on the earth and everything that creepeth on the earth. And everything in the creation um, has been given to man's control. Um, Psalm 115, verse 16 says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. And so there's very few, um, I think the New Testament says, every beast uh, hath been tamed or uh, is tamed or hath been tamed by man uh, in the book of James, but the tongue Can no man tame? It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So while men uh, have been able to subdue the, the largest animals in the world and to capture them, to harpoon them in the ocean, or to direct them and train them to you know, do tricks in a circus, um, man can't control his own tongue. He can't control his own passions, his own emotions. His mouth runs away and gets him in trouble time and time again. Uh, but yet, the, the truth of the, the scripture is nevertheless there, that man has been able to dominate and control and find ways to, to uh, subdue virtually every beast of the earth, every animal on the earth. Unless, of course, there's something um, uh, or some things in the depths of the oceans that are just so big that no effort of man could ever uh, tame them. And as far as I know, we haven't, they haven't discovered anything quite that big. There's some giant squid, there's some giant octopus. Uh, there have been stories of, of um, uh, 
uh, sperm whales that have that have been fought and caught in a struggle with these giant squid in the ocean, and you see sucker marks on the side of the whale that big around from the tentacles on the squid with which they, they contended. That's a pretty big squid. That's a pretty big octopus or whatever the, the beast was. And um, there, there may be creatures and animals yet undiscovered. I think that there's something probably legitimate to the claims of Nessie, Loch Ness Monster, uh, Champ up in Lake Champlain in, in Vermont. Um, Kent Hoven uh, dwelt on that in some of his videos. A woman named Sandy Massey and her boyfriend at the time, and she had a couple of small children, they went to Lake Champlain for a picnic and uh, they noticed something out in the water sticking its head up and she had a little instamatic camera was able to s snap off one picture and when that picture got developed there was a long serpent-headed dinosaur sticking its head up out of the water just as clear as you, as you please. A color photograph. Look up Champ, the Lake Champlain monster on the internet when you go home now you'll find that photograph of Sandy Massey's and Ken Hovind interviewed her in one of his videos, and he said, so you would say you believe what you saw resemble a dinosaur? And she said, no, it was a dinosaur. No doubt about it. And, uh, of course, the evolutionists, they want to say it's amazing that that creature has lived for 65 million years. No, it hasn't. <laughs> it's been part of, it's been reproducing, it's, it's, gen, it's, it's family been reproducing uh, in remote areas. Um, the uh, the swamplands in uh, southern central Africa, and they found uh, the, the testimonials of giant reptiles resembling dinosaurs still roaming in those parts of the, the uh, swamp where no people ever go to, and the natives say, "No, that that is what you call a dinosaur. That's there. That's so there." And there may be some truth to that. Is there's so many testimonies of it that there may be creatures out there man has not identified, but if he was able to identify it and to discover it or to capture one, he would be able to dominate it. He would subdue it. He would find some way to conquer it because God gave him that authority to do so. Now, verse 8 in our text, Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. And like I say, Psalm 115, 16 says, um, The earth hath he given to the children of men. The verse 8 says, But now we see not yet all things put under him. So then all things uh, are not fully in subjection to man, because Adam fell. Because sin entered into the world through Adam and his wife. And fallen man is under the authority of the devil, ultimately. Go forward, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Or rather backwards, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And verses 3 and 4. Paul says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Notice, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And also go back to the book of Luke, chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Here, Christ continuing with Satan out in the wilderness as he's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Luke chapter 4, <coughs> verse 6, or verse, uh, verse 5 and 6. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, 
and to whomsoever I will, I give it. And I think in Matthew's account, he says, uh, if thou shalt fall down and worship me, all shall be thine. And so the devil is said to be the god, little g, of this world, and he has authority over the kingdoms of this world, and ultimately man does not run everything. Um, when you get into the realm of, of politics, and world politics, world leadership, and um, then all of a sudden these, these secret societies of the ultra, ultra, ultra wealthy began to come into play. They began to see, you begin to see them taking a part in shaping the governments of the world, or shaping the course of politics. Brother Charles and I talked about this uh, during our break, that just when someone thinks, I've been elected president of the United States, or, or I've been elected chancellor of this country, or uh, president of this country, um, eventually he has to come to discover I'm not all, I'm not the end all be all authority that I think I am. There are secret authorities above me. And most of them are probably controlled and inspired by Satan himself. And all these secret societies which they all deny exist. And well, let's give us some solid concrete testimony that they don't exist. If they don't exist, why do you have meetings every year? If you don't exist, why do you have uh, conventions of the super wealthy people that whose wealth exceeds that of Bill Gates and, and other billionaires combined? I mean, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars beyond anything anyone could ever hope for or want in one lifetime. There are ultra wealthy people who manipulate cover governments, they manipulate politicians, they manipulate and steer the course of of world history. The John Burt Society was a very aggressive anti-communist organization founded by a Baptist missionary um, many years ago. And, um, but their motto was, world events don't just happen, but world events are made to happen. And uh, it seems like the more you read about the exploits of different governments in the world, you start to have to agree there's a lot of truth in that. They don't just happen accidentally. Now, little things happen in your day-to-day -day life that are accidental, incidental, that you had no planning. But the events of world history, the conquests of one, of, of one kingdom over another, the politics of this party versus that party, certain events are made to happen. And when they're not, and which then makes you question whether anything we do or anything we vote for has any um, merit at all. Was that election really the result of the voters deciding? I think yes and no. I think there was a large majority of people who clearly voted for, let's say, President Trump two years ago. Um, and I think this upset the apple cart for a lot of people, you know, uh, Hugh Hewitt wrote a book several years back. If they're, if um, if it's not close, they can't cheat. So you need a very clear majority in an election, pre-election process, so that they can't cheat and steal the election or say it was was false and phony. Although two years ago in America, President Trump won a clear electoral majority. And uh, Hillary Clinton was probably one of the most pathetic candidates yeah. ever to run for political office. Um, she has achieved nothing in her life. She has uh, done nothing in her life other than being the un unfortunate spouse of Bill Clinton. Otherwise, she's done nothing in her life. She has no credit to her name. And she thought just because she'd been hanging around politicians and rich donors that somehow she's owed it. It's just mine because I want it. And she's always had the media protecting her uh, in her debate with Bernie Sanders in the Democrat primary 2016. She had the questions given to her ahead of time so she could prepare a, a, a worthy answer in a debate. That's called cheating. And um, I'm glad it backfired on her. But um, don't think for a minute that President Trump is now calling the shots. I want to give him every benefit of the doubt. 
I want to give him as much support as I can. Uh, he's one president in a long time who is actually trying to fulfill what he promised during his campaign. I, I believe that. <clears throat> but, um, but as I said, there are secret authorities and powers and societies uh, much wealthier than him, and they're going to do all they can to shape and steer the course of political history um, the way they want it to go. And of course, it's all leading up to the one world of government and the man of sin and the Antichrist, and we don't deny that. You know, I, I know that those things are going to come. I guess I just don't like seeing my country leading the charge. Yeah. I don't want my country to, to be uh, at the vanguard and, and, and lead us into a one world government. Let the European Union do that. Let other countries do that. I don't want to see the United States do that. Of course, like I say, that may be way beyond my control uh, anyway. But um, he says that all things are, are not subjected, are not in subjection to man because of Adam's fall. They are under the control, ultimately, of the God of this world, Satan. And he says he has authority to give power or to give authority to whomsoever he wants to. And he was so bold, he would give Christ authority over the world if he would simply humble himself and worship Satan. <clears throat> Talk about uh, brazenness to the Son of God who actually created you, and you're going to ask him to bow down and worship you. Then verse 8 says again, but now we see not yet all things put under him. Something interrupted the original commission uh, that God gave to Adam and Eve. God told Adam to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, repopulate it. Without the entrance of sin into the equation, Adam and Eve would still be alive today. They never would have died. And it's safe to assume they would still be fulfilling that commission. Adam would not have to toil and sweat in the, brow of his, uh, the sweat of his brow. And Eve would have had painless childbirth. It would have been uh, paradise uh, circumstances around the world. So if Eve were to have uh, one child every five years, And, of course, that's a pretty um, long time between children. A lot of women have one almost every year. Don't ask me why. And all of her descendants were to have one child, let's say, every five years. And none of them would be dead either. We would, there would be at least 300 to 400 billion people <coughs> on the earth right now probably more, rather than the simple seven and a half billion, they say, is in the world now. So where would all of Adam's descendants live? Where would they find a place to even sit down with that many people covering the earth? If Adam was faithful to his commission and uh, there was no flood to come along and drown out the race of men, and then God starts over about 4,500 years ago with, with Noah, um, if, there was, if sin had not entered into the world and Adam and Eve were still reproducing and being fruitful and multiplying, where would all of his descendants go? Where would they live? Where could they sleep? Where could they stand? Every square foot of possible space on the earth would be occupied by somebody. Now, go back, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to conclude with this uh, next minute or two. We're going to probably finish a little earlier than I intended, but that's all right. We'll pick up where we left off or we'll leave off next time. Isaiah 9. And look at verses 6 and 7. Verse 6 clearly pictures the Lord Jesus in his millennial reign. For unto us a child is born, first advent, Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, second hand, and his name shall be called Wonderful,
Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now notice verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Christ's government is going to increase. That has nothing to do with the duration or the length of time. It has to do with the size and the scope of his kingdom. Adam's commission should have taken his descendants, his progeny, into outer space to fill the universe. But because of sin, uh, it did not. However, he concludes in verse 7, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So one day, the universe is going to be yours to explore, to occupy, to dwell upon, to dwell within, uh, until Christ is ready to destroy it all and maybe start again. So if Adam had fulfilled his commission and his children could continue to, to increase and grow, uh, his commission uh, would have expanded beyond just Earth to the moon, to other planets, to other stars, with the blessing of God and the power of God, um, without sin ever entering, entering into the picture. But because of sin, things were set back. And the plan of God was postponed until the second Adam should come, Jesus Christ, and suffer for sin and make a way for that, that sin in the hearts of men to be uh, forgiven, washed away clean by faith in his blood, and uh, the promise of having a glorified body just like the glorified Christ, now able and suitable to traverse the universe and uh, enjoy the creation of God. It's something you have to just sort of pause and dwell upon and let your mind <coughs> work it over a little bit. But that nevertheless has to be the case. Otherwise, we'd have 500 billion people in the world right now, and we'd all be like this, you know, squeezed into each other. You know that right now, there they say there are 7.5 billion people in the world. And they're probably correct about that that assessment, that figure. Here in the city of Ontario, California, let's imagine that, uh, you know how an airport runway is just completely flat, there are no obstructions, there's nothing standing up, no nothing to catch a, for an airplane to catch its wing on, everything is a completely flat, flat surface of the runway of an airport. Let us suppose that every structure in this town was knocked down, every tree, every light post, every electrical pole, was knocked down, and the entire city was made flat, just like the runway at an airport. It is possible that you could squeeze the entire world's population into the city limits of Ontario, California. Now, they might be standing fairly close to one another, but there would be enough room to do that. So don't let, ever let anyone tell you the world is overcrowded. If it, if it's crowded where you are, then move, right? Go someplace where it's not crowded. But if there were 500 billion people, I don't think we could do that. And uh, you, you and I would be fighting for just air to breathe if there were that many people pressing in on us everywhere we went. Uh, we have 500 million cars in Ontario, but we don't have 500 million people. <laughs> it's just, uh, I mean, everywhere you go in Southern California, Every city has just got more and more cars on both sides of the street, up and down the curb, as far as you can see. You come to a four-way stop sign, and there's a car right there all the way up to the corner at the stop sign. You can't even see it around the corner. And uh, that's another subject, but I'm going to go complain to the city council about that. But um, So the commission God gave to Adam is going to be fulfilled because of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the universe will be there for the saints to uh, enjoy and occupy one day. 